morning. Um, welcome to the TFN annual conference session on decarbonisation in the North. Um, thank you very much for attending. Um, the format for this is that we will hear from our speakers. Um, uh, please uh, do post any questions you might have um, on the Zoom chat. And then after the speakers have given their initial presentations, um, we'll be asking as many questions as we can possibly fit in, in quite a short 45 minutes. Um, our speakers are Lord Callanan, Minister for Climate Change and Corporate Responsibility at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, uh, Jamie Driscoll, the Mayor for the North of Tyne. Um, Jeremy Acklam, who is TFN's Integrated and Smart Travel Director. And Danielle Densley-Tingley, who is a Senior Lecturer at Sheffield University in Architectural Engineering. Um, a few thoughts to begin on the issue of decarbonisation. Um, nobody from any political persuasion would deny how much this matters for the North, for the UK and globally. Um, but clearly um, there are many problems along the way and the pandemic has raised even more. Um, I was interested to see some new research from Centre for Cities think tank last week, which said that while air pollution fell in the spring, um, it now exceeds pre-pandemic levels in 80% of British cities and towns, um, despite continued lockdown restrictions. And in some places, um, interestingly, as diverse as Bournemouth and Barnsley has actually risen. Um, uh, you'll also be very aware, I know it was mentioned on the previous session, um, that the public have been urged not to use public transport, which I'm sure is very painful for many people attending this session who spent years trying to encourage the public to use public transport. So with those um, initial thoughts, I'll move on. Our first speaker is Jamie Driscoll. After leaving school at 16, Jamie returned to education as a mature student and did an engineering degree at Northumbria University. He worked as an engineer. He later set up his own software development business um, before being selected as the North of Tyne mayor, which he won in an election in May 2019. He was a Labour councillor on Newcastle City Council. So, Jamie, you've got four minutes starting now. Oh, it's like being on Mastermind. Um, <laughs> thanks, Chris. Um, four points then in four minutes. First of all, levelling up is about wealth. All of the problems that we face in the North, um, life expectancy, productivity, all of these things are all related to wealth. And we can only be said to have levelled up when we actually generate the same amount of wealth as the rest of the country or more. I don't want to level up, I want to level beyond. And the way to do that is with the green industrial revolution. So the transport fits into that. We've had a fantastic announcement this week and there's still a vast amount of work to do. Um, I know I'm in the middle of it. With, for example, the British Folk Gigafactory, which is about electrifying transport. Um, not just cars, um, but particularly buses and the whole range of, um, of goods vehicles. So for that to happen we need yes we need the investment um but we need to be thinking about the way we integrate things so this comes on to the second point the transport system um we have a habit of thinking in silos we'll do some on active travel we'll do some on rail we'll do some on buses we've got to start thinking about moving people around and this requires a fairly radical shift that we need to match the the only way we're ever going to do this, because electric vehicles, yes, they produce less emissions than, than fossil fuel vehicles, but they're still massively energy intensive across the life cycle. Um, the basic principle of moving a 75 kilo human and taking a 1500 kilo vehicle with you is the basic thermodynamics of it that you cannot escape. So we need to match the convenience so that we have rock up travel so that I can just pick up my phone and I haven't had to book this thing three weeks in advance to get a decent price on a ticket. 
and just say, I want to go there, boom, um, and it will tell me the best route and the best affordability. This is, is Jeremy's specialist subject, of course. Um, but it has that level of convenience and that level of affordability because that then hits all of our economic objectives in terms of inclusive economy. You know, so that I can say to someone in Sunderland who wants a, a job in Blythe who's an apprentice, don't worry, kiddo, come to that. Your travel to and from work is now affordable. That we can do if we integrate the whole thing. In order to do that, then that's going to require political change. National governments try and do things and things do happen. But ultimately, you get these long, slow processes, and then after 10 years, we've made an 11% increase, and, and people are wonderful. Uh, you, that, that's fantastic, 11% increase in 10 years, that's never happened before. Yet yeah, we're dealing with a climate emergency, we don't have that long. The only way it's going to happen is we know that, you know, around about 8% of the journeys are intra-regional, on the functional economic area within the city region. The wider northeast of 2 million people is starting to come together. We've had negotiations with government about coming in a single mayoral combined authority, getting the transport powers, getting the half a billion transport funding. That is the way it's going to have to work to solve these problems, because only when you get to the problem, uh, to the stage, that people think, you know what, do I really need to be spending that £4,600 a year, which is the average for owning and running a car? I'll just give up having a car, because once you've done that, that's when people will start to default to public transport and active travel. And this is going to require fiscal innovations. So we need land value capture so that when we put in a new transport infrastructure, the land shoots up around it, around that new railway station, wherever it might be, that we can use that land increase to fund these things up front. That's the only way we'll get through quickly enough. And to start capturing, we're doing things like green book reviews. Well, we need to think the fact that obesity is going to cost this country 49.9 billion a year by 2050. Well, that's 1.7 billion a year in the northeast can we not use that to fund a transport system because the best way of tackling obesity down the line this is the sort of approach we need to take to the second great <clears throat> thank you very much indeed um next um martin lord callanan um martin was appointed minister for climate change and corporate responsibility at Bayes, the business department um in february of this year um, he was also a minister in the transport department um, during part of 2017. Um, he has um, a BSc in electrical and electronic engineering. Um, curiously enough, also from what is now Northumbria University, though it was then Newcastle Polytechnic. Um, he was a Conservative councillor on the former Tyne and Weir County Council and also on Gateshead Council. Um, he was a member of the European Parliament um, for North East England from 1999, re-elected in 2004 and 2009, and I promise I'm going to resist the temptation to ask him what he thinks about what's happening at the moment as we're talking about decarbonisation. Over to you, Martin. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chris, and it's uh, a great pleasure for me to be able to join you today. I do a lot of uh, national conferences, national events, so uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to be speaking at a Transport for the North conference, which of course reflects two personal interests of mine, um, having obviously once, as you mentioned, been a minister in the Department for Transport, but also of course as a, a long-time resident of Tyneside, my political roots, and I'll spend most of my time now down in London, are very much in, uh, in Tyneside. Um, let me start by saying that the coronavirus pandemic has made it more important than ever that the government continues to drive forward progress on its promise to deliver real, positive, long-term change uh, in the north of England. Uh, indeed, our aims to reach uh, net zero by 2015 will greatly depend on making our transport decarbonisation plans work, and the north, as Jamie has said, will play a key role in that success. Now, last month, the Prime Minister announced uh, what will be the first stage of a 10-point plan to deliver a green industrial revolution. Um, it's an innovative, it's an ambitious programme of job creation that will support the levelling up agenda uh, and up to 250,000 jobs in the UK. Uh, it spans clean energy, buildings, transport, nature and innovative technologies and will mobilise something like 12 billion 
of government investment to create and to support up to 250,000 highly skilled green jobs in the UK. <clears throat> and the, the idea is to try and unlock three times as much private sector investment all by 2030. For the, for the North, <clears throat> this plan will mean uh, accelerating the shift to, to zero emission vehicles through 500 million pounds of funding, which will be made available in the next four years through the Automotive Transformation Fund, securing the transformation of the automotive sector by developing and embedding the next generation of cutting edge automotive technologies uh, here in the UK, uh, and particularly in the Northeast, because of course, uh, you will have so seen the announcement in battery cell uh, manufacturing, uh, it's a priority, uh, and it is of course great news to hear that British Volt will be building the UK's first gigafactory in Blythe starting next year. So the fund will also support other strategic technologies, including motor drives, power electronics, hydrogen fuel cells. And this is only the first part of up to 1 billion commitment uh, made by the government to ensure that the UK takes advantage of this once in a generation opportunity. <clears throat> and that will run in tandem with our pledge to end the sale of new petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2030. This will, of course, not only improve air quality in our towns and cities, but it will also help to protect the existing roughly 170,000 jobs in the automotive sector. And, and of course, we know that many of them are based in the north and northeast. The 10 point plan that the Prime Minister announced will also be building on our existing expertise in wind energy. We are world leaders by investing 160 million towards delivering at least one offshore wind port hub and delivering several major manufacturing facilities in Northeast England. The plan will also look to get the UK at the forefront of other new exciting technologies like uh, carbon capture usage and storage. We're going to be investing billion pounds via the CCUS infrastructure fund to support the establishment of CCUS in four industrial clusters created in conjunction with the development of our hydrogen production capacity super places uh, in areas such as Humber, Seaside and Merseyside. So the UK has a strong track record. Uh, it should give us the confidence to deliver on this plan. We have already demonstrated that growing our economy and cutting emissions can be achieved together. We've grown our GDP by 75% whilst reducing our emissions by 43% since 1990, creating new green industries so that there are now almost half a million jobs in low carbon businesses and their supply chains across the UK. But of course, nobody underestimates the scale of the challenge. We have to do more. In particular, we will need to do more to concentrate our efforts on transport decarbonisation. Because of the UK's success in decarbonizing other sectors like waste and energy, transport is now proportionately the largest contributor to UK emissions. It's essential to get national, local government, businesses, the public working together on this issue. In July, the Transport Secretary established the Northern Transport Acceleration Council, which will give uh, leaders like Jamie and others across the North direct access to ministers to discuss priority transport projects make sure that they're being progressed at pace, providing a mechanism for speeding up decision making. But we also need to give local areas in Northern England the power to make changes to their own transport systems that can help decarbonisation efforts at a local level. In the March 2020 budget, government agreed a deal with the West Yorkshire Combined Authority to establish a mayoral combined authority with a directly elected mayor from May 2021 and that deal will provide 1.1 billion of investment for the area over 30 years, developing significant new powers to the area on transport, planning and skills, and provide unprecedented opportunities for growth in the region. I won't touch on the issue of whether Tyneside will do the same, I'll leave that to, uh, to Jamie. But businesses in the north already are making bold steps to decarbonise the way we travel. To just take one example, let me commend Bentley, headquartered in Crewe, which has announced its electrification program, committing to producing only electric cars by 2030. But to help businesses and local regions go further, we will also need to ensure global action on decarbonisation. As you're all aware, November next year, the UK will host COP26 in Glasgow, bringing together world leaders, climate experts, business leaders, and others to create ambitious plans to tackle climate change, 
and encourage further decarbonisation efforts in areas such as transport. So we're at the start of a new green industrial revolution and the UK is already in a position of strength. The opportunities are significant, but unlocking them will require difficult decisions to be made and that will need large inputs from government and industry supported and driven by shifting public attitudes and behavioural changes. And while the start of this decade has probably not gone as well or as to plan as we would have all have liked, it does provide us with the opportunity to build back better, to build back greener and faster. And I will certainly be doing my bit to ensure that the North of England plays its part in this transition. Thank you, Chris. Right. Thank you, Martin. Uh, next, we have Jeremy Acklam. Jeremy is Transport for the North Integrated and Smart Travel Director. He joined TFN in 2020, so this year, with a track record of working in digital technology and smart travel sectors, clearly very important to this discussion. Um, he co-led the development and launch of the UK's first online rail ticket retailer travel uh, train line and worked on the early development and delivery of the national ITSO smart card system. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, I think one of the uh, interesting challenges that has already come out around decarbonisation is the fact that we're actually going to have to persuade people to want to do this. Um, it, it isn't something that can be essentially mandated. It's all about incentivization. And uh, what we're doing as a, as a uh, pan-regional transport body is uh, putting together our decarbonisation strategy along with all of our partners and stakeholders and looking at how that steps across into the actual uh, transportation activities that we are undertaking. Um, basically as policy guidance aligned to our future travel scenarios and uh, all of those associated plans, including those uh, of the team that, that I lead, the integrated and smart travel team. So the key thing for us is how we engage and how we drive forward that uh, decarbonisation agenda. And it's a really important one because it is something which, you know, we, we are all broadly targeted on achieving by 2050. But we cannot do that by doing something, you know, in the late 2040s. This is going to have to be something which is started uh, and, and in progress now. And so what we are doing in the Integrated and Smart Travel team is to um, basically enable that capability in our existing transport networks. Because what is required is to digitize transport. If, uh, if you're trying to do anything around incentivization, you must be able to uh, connect to transport in a way which you can then take forward. And digitization is the way of doing that. We've seen that in many other industries across the world, most recently in manufacturing industry, in what is called uh, Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. And what we're bringing forward in the IST team in Transport for the North is how we translate that into transportation. So how we bring forward that next revolution in transportation so that we can support local smart ticketing in traditional transportation. We can support active travel uh, and demand responsive travel, all of those being integrated together essentially in what we're calling a smart north ecosystem. And that Smart North ecosystem, we're currently developing uh, prototypes with uh, an innovation program that we're running in association with the Department for Transport. Uh, we're, of course, looking for the spending review outcomes to allow us to extend that across the whole region. We're working with each of our city region partners to achieve this. And um, we believe that it is by creating a smart north ecosystem that we can digitally connect all of the different transport actors around the north whether that is an individual cycling to a transport hub and then being offered a discount for a subsequent public transport journey or somebody sharing a, an alternatively fueled vehicle uh, as a journey to work for instance it uh, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's traditional transport as we know it now or the future of transport as it will uh, be become clear in the next 10 years. 
that digitization step is key to making this whole thing work. And so what we are doing is working on creating and enabling a cooperative digital ecosystem between everybody involved in transport, whether they are individuals who use transport or transport operators or agencies managing and controlling transport across the North. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Lastly, we have Danielle Densley-Tingley. Danielle is Senior Lecturer in Architectural Engineering in the Civil and Structural Engineering Department at Sheffield University. She's committed to reducing the whole life carbon of the built environment as an investigator on Decarbon N8, decarbonizing uh, transport network. She leads work on infrastructure digitization and demand reduction. She's interested in how the built environment shapes our use of transport and consequently influences its decarbonization. Danielle, over to you. Thanks very much, Chris. So I'd like to start off with highlighting the urgency of the decarbonisation challenge. We have a very limited carbon budget if we are to increase the chances of staying within one and a half to two degrees of warming. And this budget is incredibly small. To give you a local example, a recent report by the Tyndall Centre suggested for the, for the city of Sheffield, we could use up our portion of the national budget in as little as six years with business as usual emissions. Six years, that's a terrifyingly short time frame. And that is the budget out to 2050 and indeed beyond. So we really need to think about not just what are the long term things we can do, but what can we do now? What can we do very fast? And if we think about how much um, of our, the UK's emissions transport takes up, this is around 28% of our carbon emissions. Bearing this in mind, this is just our operational emissions. So this is the emissions effectively from the tailpipes of our vehicles. We've also got to consider the capital or embodied emissions of our infrastructure and indeed our transport fleet. This means we need to start taking a whole life approach, which is definitely missing um, at the kind of national level. And we need to start thinking about if we're investing in new infrastructure, we're not just investing money, we are investing carbon. How much carbon are different infrastructure event, in, interventions going to cost us? And do they start to pay back in operational terms? And how quickly are they paying back? Only by taking that approach will we actually meet these carbon budgets we need to. As an example, Northern Powerhouse Ra Rail will likely reduce operational emissions if it shifts people out of their cars onto public transport. If we can start to make that shift, this is going to be a really positive way of saying, yes, that's worthwhile as investing that carbon. What we need to be mindful of is some of these interventions aren't going to give us immediate reductions. So Northern Powerhouse Rail isn't going to start construction straight away. We've got a bit of a time lag and then the benefits are going to be a bit later. So for me, the question to the panel um, and that I think everyone on, on here needs to be thinking about is what measures can we put in place now that will start to reduce emissions next year because we need reduction right now. Yes, with the pandemic, we have seen some reductions in emissions. But if we also think about the shift we're seeing uh, away from public transport that we've seen with the pandemic, and if we look at some of the monitoring we've been doing in Sheffield and indeed across the north, we're seeing that current <coughs> car levels are up to 80 to 90 percent of pre-pandemic levels. And that's with an awful lot of people still working from home. This leaves us with the question, how do we get people back onto public transport? How do we avoid an emissions rebound once we come out of the pandemic? And that's a very real risk that next year we're actually going to see an increasing proportion of transport emissions. How do we avoid that? We can't afford it in budget terms, in our carbon budget terms. So thinking about those, so I'd like to just wrap up by raising a kind of couple of key questions and challenges. What do we do now to reduce emissions next year? How do we avoid that emissions rebound? And how do we embed a whole life cycle approach in how we tackle emissions so that it's not the Department of Transport and Bays fighting against each other for who deals with infrastructure and carbon investments. We've got to tackle that together. It's a national problem. And I'll wrap up there slightly early, Chris. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank members of the audience who I see have been very active in posting questions as well. Um, given that time is short, what I'll do 
is I'll ask a question to each of our panelists by name, which will pick up both on what they've said in their presentations and also on what audience members are asking. I know we'll not be able to cover many audience questions, so I hope this will at least satisfy some people that there's <coughs> been an airing of their, their interest. So I'll start in reverse order. Danielle, I'll invite you to answer the question you asked, what can we do now, namely in 2021, given that we are in danger of actually seeing a reversal of efforts and a retreat to people using private cars, often second-hand cars, um, bought to precisely try and avoid going on public transport. So if you'd like to just spend a minute or two at most on that, and then I will move on to other questions with other panellists. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I think for me, the quickest thing we can do is behaviour change in terms of if everyone on this call asks themselves, do I need to get in an individual car? Do I own a car? Do I need to own a car? Can I start to shift to active um, or public transport? Looking at those sorts of strategies is where we're going to see if everyone did it, we'd see a really nice reduction very quickly. We're not relying on technology rollout or anything. Um, so for me, that would be the quickest thing. We also very often see that behavior change is one of the hardest things to do. So for me, it's about personal responsibility and asking ourselves, everyone on here, what can we do and how quickly can we do it? Right, thank you. That's very clear and to the point. Um, in a sense, going on from that, Jeremy, you said that decarbonisation is about incentivization. Um, you've been very involved in development of integrated mm -hmm. smart travel systems. I wonder if you could give some practical thoughts on how we can incentivize people to not use cars um, or if they do use cars to switch to means that would be less carbon intensive. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we, we only need to uh, look quite closely uh, at the near continent to see how this can be done, um, because, you know, in Denmark and in the Netherlands, uh, there is there is uh, a well developed ecosystem of uh, incentivizing people to use um, you know other modes of transport. Um, it, it can be done, but if those incentives are not there, there will be very little chance of uh, people voluntarily uh, moving uh, from one mode to another. And so it's about inc incorporating those incentives into the levers that you that you bring into uh, society and the way that it operates. So, for instance, if you are you know, working for a company who um, who cares also about the environment, uh, then working together with that company so that they may, for instance, offer a discount for public transport journeys, potentially as a salary sacrifice, for instance, um, uh, works very well. But it has to be multiple parties coordinating and working together which is the need, which really is why we are focusing on creating that uh, digital ecosystem, because it's only when you can incorporate employers and people and transport operators and things like bikes and cars in that ecosystem that you can actually truly begin to offer, the, offer people a real incentive to make that change. Right, thank you. Uh, Martin, Lord Callanan, um, I think it's time to give you a little light grilling. Um, you were keen to talk about the, um, the schemes and measures that the government has talked of taking in the coming years as part of the green industrial uh, revolution. And I think many people listening to this session are quite frustrated that electrification of rail seems to have been taking an absolute age. Um, I'd like to ask you more about what are the intentions on rail investment, particularly in relation to electrification and improving current rail, um, such as um, moving more freight onto the rail system and making it robust enough to, to take an increase. Over to you, please. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, but it will come as no surprise to you when I say that I, I can't answer those questions because I'm not a minister in the transport department uh, anymore. I know that the plans are advancing, but I can't predict and, and predate any announcements that transport will make anymore. I'm now in, uh, in business 
and uh, industry. Um, but I know that the government is committed to the levelling up uh, agenda. I know there's commitments to the various schemes in the north, um, talking to other MPs and others about reopening old railway lines, the electrifying the, uh, the, the, the various lines that need doing in the north, etc. So I know the commitments are there to do that. I can't give you specific information on when those announcements might come or uh, what the timescales are. I do know that all from when I was in um, transport a few years ago now, um, many of these projects take a long time to deliver. That's just a sad reality of the of the planning process in, in, in the UK. And many of the announcements that we were making three and four years ago are only now starting to, to come on stream. So all transport investment takes a long time to deliver. There was lots of um, lots of investment when Jane during the period of the coalition government, and many of those schemes now are still half delivered. One of the reasons that you see so much disruption on on the railway lines now, as as work is progressing, is the improvement work that is done. Various stations are closed in order to get that done, but it does take many many years to deliver. These are long term schemes that require planning and delivery over sometimes decades. Hmm. Uh, I'll come back to you, if I may. You, you said you're not a transport minister, so you can't comment on this. But more generally, as you were telling us about the government's commitment, um, how can the people listening into this session hold um, government feet to the fire to actually ensure that these things don't just become an on the day great soundbite that then sort of retreats into the middle distance? Well. I mean, through elections, I suppose, ultimately is the is the reason that governments, uh, MPs, local politicians like Jamie and others are always are all held to account. But as I said, one of the one of the difficulties of, of transport is always that, you know, in politics, everybody wants, you know, a quick win. You want to make the announcement and you want people to see the delivery on the ground. But, you know, all of these issues, whether it be climate change, whether it be uh, transport planning, environment uh, changes, will take place over many many years decades uh, in in some ex some respects um but we are all held to what well, i'm not as a an elected peer but in general the government uh, the elected part of the government uh, are held to account uh, regularly at uh, at elections and through the democratic process right thank you uh jamie you mentioned electric vehicles and obviously only on friday we heard about the new investment in blythe um, I've noticed that some people on the chat function have been saying, let's not get carried away about electric vehicles. Um, they have their downsides, they have their limitations, and I'd like to know your further thoughts on that. I think that's pretty much correct, Chris. Um, we know that, for example, with the, the clean air issue, cities like Newcastle, other cities across the country, that uh, when you look at it, between 50 and 55% of the particulates, which are particularly damaging to health, are coming from brakes and tyres. Um, electric vehicles, true, they, they don't have so much wear on the brakes, but they've still got rubber, and you're still taking a tonne and a half vehicle to move a single 75 kilo on average person. Um, we will get there when we have, uh, uh, Daniel's right about individual behaviour change, but it's notoriously difficult to do. It will happen when it's easier to not use your car than to use your car. Um, I always think about things from a systems thinking point of view. What is the barrier that's stopping it happening in any way? Now, if it's difficult, it's a pain to park in Newcastle city centre. It's probably a pain to park in most city centres. So why don't we make it easier to get there on public transport? The reason a lot of people won't cycle is not because they're, they're too late. It's because they're worried someone's going to nick their bike. All of this sort of stuff is what we need to fix. Why is it that we're limited in how we can spend our money to green tarmac and street furniture? Why can't we say to someone, right, we'll go halves with you on putting a shower in your place so that your workers can have a shower when they get there? These are the things that make behaviour change possible that's the approach it's going to happen and um yeah martin is quite right when he says that these things take ages to come online they do there is no physical law of the universe that says they have to take ages one of the reasons to take ages is because of the very political cycle that martin's talking about there so that people want to come in they want to make their impacts we all know that in actual facts and when it comes to national elections Almost nobody votes on the basis of just transport or just immigration or just the health and everything gets lumped together and it's almost no cut through. So what we want is some clarity on this thing, some lines through. We're doing work with our citizens assembly to encourage people and to learn the best ways of getting behaviour change, how people might actually get involved. 
but it, it strikes me that the transport in the functional economic areas is best devolved to those functional economic areas, that we work with the national agencies like Highways England and Network Rail. For example, there's a scheme going in around the side of Newcastle on the Western Bypass that's uh, gonna, it's there only because there's congestion in peak hours. It's commuter traffic, it's not strategic traffic. And it's gonna cost about 180 million quid to change, to, to squeeze three lanes into where there's currently two. If they'd just said, look, Jamie, that's 180 million quid. Can you solve it by improving better active travel, better public transport? We could have done it. We'd have had a better outcome and it wouldn't have cost the public any more. That's the kind of level of devolution we need. So there's your answer. That's how we get this thing. We, Daniel's absolutely right. Uh, Daniel's absolutely right. We've way past the targets of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, even if we hit those targets, we're going to hit 3.2 degrees of warming is the, the, the median estimate. And... Um, and then we, we're in a runaway territory. Um, we not only have to get change now, we also have to be doing wrestling all the, oh, the, the wheel of this ship to try and stop us hitting that, that carbon capture iceberg, if that's not the wrong way, because that's very, very cold. And it's going to be warm and it's going to be the issue. Um, but we have to have radical devolution in streamlining of the powers to do this mm. we're going to have to solve the way we fund this and that's going to require fiscal innovations we cannot go through the standard spending review because we were due a comprehensive spending review this year understandably it didn't happen but why is it that i'm in the dark about when well i'll be able to announce the northumberland line is on is on we need <laughs> we need to cut through all of this if we're going to save um our economy our planet and our children's futures mm. Right, thank you. Some big points there. Um, we're very near the end of the session. I think I should ask all and any of you, um, as this is Transport for the North, do you think there are any particular challenges that the North has in terms of decarbonisation and any particular advantages that it might have in actually implementing measures which could lead, lead the way and provide some exemplars for others to follow? I'll open that to any of you in conclusion, if we may. Well, there's the, the basic physics of it doesn't change anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. So from that point of view, no. Um, it's notable though in London, for example, where you have an integrated public transport system. It could be, you know, I'm sure if Sadiq were on this call, he'd tell you all the things that he wanted to make it better, um, as he regularly tells me. Um, but there you have a system that is entirely under transport for London. So the buses integrate with the, the light rail, integrates with the tube, all the rest of it. We don't have that anywhere else. That's got to be a part of it. Um, and I know that all of my um, colleagues, mayors and um, city leaders uh, are in exactly the same page on this in wanting a franchise system that can be controlled, can be looked after and can be integrated so that we don't end up with this. What delays this is when you then have to negotiate with private providers and then go through a legal mechanism to get them to do the things that they want to do, that we want to do. I had a conversation with a, a bus um, company um, CEO and he was saying, yeah, actually, I think what you're now telling me, Jamie, is really good because it will triple the ridership on our buses but we're, we're locked in this greedy algorithm that how do we get over each step? That's what we've got to fix. Thank you. Danielle, you were nodding there. What are your thoughts? Um, so really it was, it was agreeing that we need that approach to more of an integrated system. So if you look at where emissions are and how emissions vary depending on where you live, generally urban areas find it much easier to have lower transport emissions per person. Rural, it's harder because you don't have that, generally don't have a connectivity um, into public transport but you also see with London because of the bigger spread of their connect um, of their public transport network they've got that lower emission per capita per person than we do in the north so I think if you've got a potential to link our cities better link the suburbs to our city centres so people are able to travel in the north between cities and within their city easily and quickly on public transport that's how we're going to ultimately decarbonise um, transport emissions in the north. And I think for me, that's where we're very different, uh, particularly to London, is, and that's why I was nodding along, that they do have a much better um, public, connected public transport system. Yeah, if I can, if I can come in there. I mean, I, would, I obviously can't make specific commitments, but I do agree in general with the, the importance of integration of uh, transport systems. And I, I kind of get a bit of a personal perspective of that because, of course, I spend half my time in central London and a lot of my time up in the north as well and it's interesting to see 
the different transport systems in operation in both uh, in both places. So, for instance, I wouldn't dream of having a car taking my car down to central London. There's no point. It's uh, it's hugely expensive. You can't make much park it, and it's not a lot of use for it. I mean, I've joined a car club down here. I I can I can do that again, but in the northeast, it, it's easier and simpler to have your own car because parking is not so expensive. Parking spaces are more prevalent. There's more room. There's less people apart from anything else. And of course, to get out to the rural parts of the of the region, best in the country in my view, it's um it's much easier to have your own car to do that. So it is all about in incentives and uh, behavioural change will come. Um, when you met, when it, when it becomes uh, obvious to people that the easier option is to uh, is to use the transport system that is available for you. Thank you, Jeremy. Quick thought from you. And uh, that is exactly where the digital ecosystem comes in. The whole point uh, about making sure that everything is connected is to enable decarbonisation. Um, and that is exactly what we are uh, expecting to hear uh, positive news from uh, from the government in this coming financial year. Right, thank you. Well, in conclusion, I, I think it's evident that despite the political differences between members of our panel, there is unity on the need to do something, the need to do it as fast as possible, and the difficulties uh, on a practical level of incentivizing people um, we haven't even touched on the financial problems that mm. are looming as a result of the pandemic, but I'm sure that will be covered in other sessions. Um, I would like to thank our panellists very much. I'd also like to thank all the people on the chat function who seem to have been having quite an animated conversation between themselves, um, which is obviously part of what the uh, conference is all about, whether virtual or real um, in the flesh. In conclusion, thank you very much to our speakers. This is obviously a key subject um, with no easy resolution, but is going to be dominant in the coming years.